Welcome to the online course Youth Work, The Essentials, brought to you by the partnership between the European Commission and the Council of Europe in the field of youth. Nearing almost the end of the second week of learning in the uh, MOOC, I'm very happy um, to welcome two very passionate people about youth work, to thinkers, uh, educators, practitioners of youth work who will be challenging us hopefully and uh, giving us some hints around the topic of uh, boundaries of youth work. Um, in the module two particularly, we explored different approaches and questions around definitions of youth work. And uh, there were a few exercises for the um, participants um, to, to write their own definition. So let's see how that tests out today in the exploration that we will have with Susan Cooper and Maria Pisani. Uh, finally, just to mention also that this MOOC is uh, happening at a, an interesting time, at least in European policy frameworks, because we have now youth work as a priority in the strategy of the European Union uh, for the next seven years, but also in the Council of Europe Youth Sector Strategy. So if two large organizations are focusing on youth work, that should be exciting. Um, and at the end of this year, in the beginning of December, there is the third uh, European Youth Work Convention and the conventions have been for uh, where a lot of uh, reflections, a lot of thinking, a lot of developments around youth work, particularly in Europe, have happened. So we hope that this MOOC and the webinars as part of the MOOC uh, will be continuing to contribute to that dynamic thinking around it. So I welcome, I pass the floor to Katya, my co-host, and co-course instructor. Please, Katja. Uh, thank you, Tanya. And hello, everyone. Nice to see that we have now around 80 participants already in Zoom. I don't know how much in Facebook. And this is first important things that uh, our webinar is now live in Facebook and also is a Zoom webinar. And I have some technicalities for you to be uh, um, uh, that I will tell you in order to understand how we will proceed today. Because today we have two guest speakers, Maria Pisani and Susan Cooper, and we will have two presentations. Uh, it um, will appear that you will have questions. So where, can you, where and when can you ask these questions? If you are in the Zoom, then you can see questions and answer button it's uh, down on the right. So if you have a question while uh, Susan or Maria are doing their presentation about, about the presentation topics that they're touching, then you can just write down your question in this question and answers. There is one hint because there are a lot of us. <laughs> so be attentive to the questions that other people are writing down because if you have the same question in your mind, you can just like uh, the question that you see that other person already have posted, yeah? So that's how also we'll see which questions has the most interest and that's how we can uh, later on um, rate them, yes? And to ask the questions that more people are interested in because unfortunately we won't have a lot of time for answers and questions because in total we calculate that the webinar will last one hour, 15 minutes, maximum one and a half and having two presentations and then we will have like 15, 20 minutes for the questions and answers. But uh, then I think that more questions you have, uh, participants of the MOOC, you can uh, take part in the discussion in the module two. And uh, there you can share your reflections about the webinar as well and uh, the questions that popped up in your mind. If you are not enrolled yet in the MOOC, <laughs> You still have, uh, you still can do it and you can find the link on the partnership Facebook page. Uh, what else should I say? I think for the technicalities that all, we have also here Marietta with us, who support us technically. 
and uh, I think that I will uh, pass floor to pass microphone or pass yes Tanya uh, just to add that we are recording the webinar and that is because we have a lot of participants from different time zones so we will be able to make the results of our discussions available for them and we also will be preparing graphic reporting of the webinar. So sometime beginning of next week, for those who are following the MOOC, you are, um, you are going to be able to see, let's see a graphic summary, but of course uh, you are invited to follow, to hear at least the presentations of our guest speakers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tanya. Yes, this is very important that everything will be recorded and stay in uh, the history so you can check it after as well. And people who are cannot attend can uh, watch it later. So Susan Cooper from the Plymouth Margin University, England. Susan uh, has a huge experience in youth work, yes, as I understand, in different settings, formal, informal, non-formal. So Susan, I pass you camera or microphone on the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to try and share my screen. So let's just see whether that's working. Yes, yes, it works. That's work. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, hello, everyone. This is a wonderful opportunity to, to talk to you about um, youth work, something that we all enjoy doing all of the time. So very pleased to, to have the opportunity. Um, uh, as as uh, was just said, I'm a, currently uh, an educator of uh, youth workers in England, but um, I have a quite a long history of practitioner work as well. And, and quite a lot of that was spent working in settings that were not traditional in terms of youth work. So um, I'm going to be looking at some of the, the perhaps the, the the challenges of working with others um, and, I, and I will say at the beginning that this is this is really set within a within a, an England context not even a UK context because things are different between the nations but certainly within an English context so I hope you'll be able to transfer some of the things that I'm saying to to your own settings um, so I just moving on. So just to say, um, as, as you will probably already know, that actually there are a number of different sorts of professionals that work with a, with a purpose of supporting young people and young people's uh, journeys through life. So uh, teachers and health professionals, etc. You can see a, a list that I've put together here and it's not, it's, it doesn't cover everyone, but within uh, the English context, this, this is, covers most of the people that might be involved in supporting young people. Um, interestingly, these uh, professions have different aims and uh, different cultures uh, and so different ways of working and I think what one of the things that hopefully will come out of some of the discussions we have today will be about how those differences can uh, either get in the way of shared working or actually enhance shared working. Um, so we are all different uh, and it's about how we manage those differences that, that's um, interesting. So moving on to this second slide, uh, this notion of interprofessionalism uh, and interprofessional collaboration has been around within the English context for a number of years now. I mean, you can see here that really this all began in the 1960s, but really came into, into fruition probably in the mid 90s onwards when the, the modernization agenda was all about efficiency as much as the effectiveness of um, services from a service user perspective. And this is really within the health and social care services. Uh, this idea that professionals working in silos, um, you know, was, was wasteful, uh, but also it meant that people who were involved in those services had to, um, you know, go from one place to another place to another place to get the support that they needed. So there's something about 
pulling down the silos, pulling down the boundaries, uh, the barriers, so that people would work better together. Um, and this new way of working would improve standards, but also reduce costs. But what was very interesting and uh, um, uh, unfortunate, I would say, in the UK setting is that within England, there, there's a notion really that youth workers were invisible in this, in this drive to work together. Um, and I have a quotation here from Community Care that talks about these different groups of professionals. So it talks about social workers, talks about teachers, talks about police officers, but doesn't mention youth workers at all. So if you think back to that earlier slide when I had those various people around the young person, uh, social workers were there, teachers and, and police officers, but no consideration of youth workers in that particular setting. And I think that that is um, reflective of the policy uh, landscape in England at the moment in terms of youth work uh, and we often look towards our, our, uh, our colleagues in, in, in other nations particularly in Scotland where that's a very different situation but that's where we are at the moment. There was a thought that also is another example of, of collaborative working here where um, youth offending teams were set up again in the late 90s and this comes directly from the from the statute and you can see again the list of professionals that needed to work together and and share working and again youth workers are not in that list so for me that's really problematic it said something about the way that youth work was viewed uh, in the policy uh, discourse that actually it, it wasn't seen um, in the same uh, with the same status as these other professionals. Interestingly, within the yacht information, you can see that right at the bottom, youth workers are mentioned, but they're, they're in the bracket of other supporting staff. So again, it's, it's not really recognising the value and, uh, and, and the importance of, of youth work in England uh, at this time. Interestingly, uh, following the, the pandemic, the National Youth Agency, our, our national body, um, are arguing strongly and campaigning for youth workers to be seen as key workers uh, during the pandemic. So we'll see whether that makes any, any change. But my, my point is really that we, we, as youth workers, have never really been invited to the table. Um, uh, and uh, that has been challenging for us at, at a policy level. But I think that there's a very useful quotation here in terms of actually, just because we haven't been invited uh, at a policy level, it doesn't mean we haven't been um, working hard around the edges, in the fringe, in the shadows, to actually be part of the uh, workforce that supports young people because we know that we've got something um, to bring to that um, that partnership so it is about youth workers uh, doing things locally and uh, making connections locally rather than nationally and that's where the changes have, have come about so that leads me on to talking more about uh, informal and uh, formal settings so um, as I said at the beginning I've, I've spent quite a lot of time in my practice life around uh, working within schools and, uh, and pupil referral centres and this, uh, this raises some questions about whether, whether youth work can actually take place in a school setting and this has been contested for many uh, decades that there, there are people that strongly believe yes you can do youth work in a formal education setting and others which would absolutely disagree and say you might be working with young people but you cannot call it youth work so this is this is something that has always been contested and will i'm sure continue to be contested as we move forward so i think the thing for me is about trying to find your own position in that 
um, as a as a youth worker, what are your views? What what are the lines that you will draw in the sand? Um, what 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 are the possibilities um, for youth work practice in these formal settings? And where where is is the where are the challenges so great that actually you feel like you can't really um, align your value base, your, your, uh, your values, um, the values of youth work to what you're actually doing. So um, this is what I'm going to talk about in a, in a bit more detail, really, in terms of whether or not youth work can happen in school settings. So just a bit of context. And again, I know this is um, uh, the context is, is the is the English one. Um, but it's quite a useful one to, to think about, I think, in terms of some of the historical literature that is around. Um, so, again, I think looking back, uh, there was a time when youth work and, um, and schooling were quite close, particularly, for example, following the Albemarle report when uh, there was a, a large scale building programme uh, that went on. Uh, and through that program, many youth centres were actually built on school sites. So really bringing them together. Um, but despite that, there was later some disagreement uh, in the Fairburn Milson Committee, where you know one fraction was supporting this um, collaboration between schooling and youth work, and others were very anti the idea of putting. Um, youth centres on school sites because they were kind of viewing the fact that actually um, the, the school should come into the community rather than the community going into the school. Um, but interestingly at that time uh, if you were a qualified teacher and you got your qualification prior to 1989 then you were rec that, that qualification enabled you to um, hold a professional youth work post. So there was actually some combination in terms of the education and training of, of youth workers and teachers as well, some shared um, or some crossover there. So, so there, has, there is some basis for, for youth work and schooling to, to um, meet uh, 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 together. But um, moving on from there, there is, as I said, is often viewed that, that youth work and school and are just too different for them to, to be good bedfellows. So uh, some of the arguments around that is about that voluntary relationship. So youth work is, is about voluntary relationships. Um, it's about what happens in young people's leisure time, for example, whereas schooling is compulsory. Um, that notion that youth work focuses on the relationship aspect um, building between the youth worker and the young people, whereas schooling is all about the, the content, the, the, the curriculum. Uh, uh, but there are those uh, that argue that actually this dichotomy that was, that, that's been running for such a long time is actually a false dichotomy. Um, and I draw on Coburn and Gormley's idea of border pedagogy um, as a way of thinking about how we can do or, or how we can uh, engage with youth work in a school setting and this notion that uh, um, it is by it's by working in these in these uh, contested areas at the edge of what's comfortable perhaps for us to actually think about what can we change yeah are these are these boundaries are these borders necessary are they do, can we can we deconstruct them and, and think about things slightly differently? Can we also think about the processes of youth work? Uh, and can we think about those differently in this setting? Because arguably, um, young people do go to school. It is a compulsory part of their day. But in terms of access, um, certainly in rural areas, you know, there, there might be no access for young people to, uh, to, to engage with youth work other than in schools. So there's, there, is a, there is a sense of the, the value of being able to deliver youth work in schools 
in terms of extending the access. So uh, this next slide, uh, please don't try and read all of this at once, but these are the nine questions that um, Bernard Davis includes, includes in his uh, manifesto, uh, Revisited. So his, his, his work really is challenging whether or not when youth work is carried out in settings, uh, in spaces where these things are not possible, then we shouldn't really be calling it youth work. It is, it is work with young people. It does have value, he suggests, but we can't call it youth work. Um, so you could, you could look at all of these points, all of these questions uh, and think about, can this be achieved in a school setting? Or actually, you could argue, is this question essential uh, in my thinking uh, as to whether or not youth work can, can be conducted? For the sake of this presentation, I'm only going to look at the first three. So the idea of uh, participatory, um, voluntary participation, something to do with power and something to do with um, uh, imposed labels so whether we're working with young people because of their labels so I'm going to look at those three questions that Davis uh, raises uh, and apply those to um, youth work in schools so this notion of participatory uh, particip participation whether it's voluntary or not is a is for Davis, uh, as you can see from this, this slide, he's suggesting that perhaps it's actually a defining feature of youth work, that actually young people are choosing uh, to go uh, to open access settings. But the argument is, is that what part voluntary participation means? Is it, is it really about being able to walk into, into a space and out of the space? Is that what makes it voluntary or can we understand voluntary participation in different ways um, so if you if you hold to um, Bernard's uh, notion then you you could say that young people in schools they they can't decide to to walk out but um, uh, Copeland and Gormley again, uh, just to give a, a, a different side to the story, uh, suggest that actually it depends on how we frame our practice as to whether or not part uh, participation can be voluntary or not. And that's the question. If we think about our practice differently, then maybe we can um, offer uh, a different way of working that is still based on the values of equality and social justice. So we're not going against our value base, we're actually being able to adhere to our value base. So there's that notion about how it, it, it just depends on how we conceive our practice. So um, one of the readings that I, I suggested is from Blackham uh, and um, you can see how they work through this notion of participative, uh, voluntary participation. The next um, point that, that uh, Davis uh, talks about is this notion of uh, labelling. Yeah, so this idea that uh, youth work in schools is often targeted, and certainly um, in England youth workers, if they are working in schools or employed by schools, they're employed in the inclusion unit. Uh, they're working with young people that have problematic behaviours in terms of their uh, attendance and engagement with um, mainstream education. They are perhaps seen as a problem uh, rather than as a uh, young person. So uh, they're you know, it's hard to argue against the fact that there is there is a, a high focus on this targeted work in schools. Um, and the additional bit of that is that then young people are referred to the youth worker, so they're sent. Uh, and that raises questions about that voluntary participation again. 
um, and it's often one uh, one to one work as opposed to group work. So again, challenging the, the kind of ethos of what is youth work. Um, my response to this is a but and kind of response in that in England, the traditional youth work that used to happen in community based settings has been in decline since around uh, 2008. Um, there are very few options now for young people to actually attend open access youth work um, and uh, indeed reduced options for them to seek help and seek support when they feel they need it. So this notion of self-referral is very difficult. Um, using Coburn and Gormley again, they make a point that actually, if in schools, we give young people who have a label, a chance to think about that, to express their views, to be listened to, to reframe that label, to move it from a, a individual to a sort of societal uh, issue, can be extremely beneficial. So yes, we may well be work, working with uh, young people that have been sent to us for particular reasons, uh, for reasons where their behaviour doesn't conform to what's required in the school. Um, there is still opportunities to enable those young people to uh, explore, to reflect, to challenge those labels, to think about actions, um, collective actions to challenge some of those labels uh, uh, and so on. So there is still uh, space for youth work. Um, the third issue that we're going to just briefly look at is this notion of power. Of course, this is a big issue in formal settings as opposed to informal settings. So schools are seen as, you know, pretty regimented, um, lots of enforced rules that maybe seem um, a little petty at times. Uh, the whole notion of uniform and the way we address each other. So that notion that actually we shouldn't be using first names where youth workers find it quite challenging I think to um, to be referred to as sir or or miss uh, it feels really uncomfortable for us uh, and so uh, this idea about relationships and being friendly as opposed to being sort of perhaps a little more detached in the way that teachers are so there's some issues there that are, that are difficult um, whether we, we whether we uh, can enforce those rules that belong to the school or whether we find ways of working around those so we're actually kind of um, undermining those rules and that's been some of the problems that youth workers have experienced um, because the school feels that they're not um, you know they're not encouraging young people to follow the rules so lots of challenges around this power issue um, Blackham and Smith, who I was talking about earlier, that reading that I've suggested, they drew on the notion of controlling practice, which actually comes from something Sarah Banks had, had written. Um, and I think this is a really useful idea because um, this idea of controlling practice means that, you know, you, you promote uh, voluntary participation and you support young people to um, have a view and express that view. But at the same time, you're helping them to understand that actually in society, as a society, we all have to kind of understand and, and adhere to certain boundaries, certain social boundaries. This is about pro-social behaviour um, as opposed to other things. So it's an interesting way to, to sort of think about those power issues and the way that we manage that notion of are we tipping the balance of power in favour of the young people um, and is that a defining feature of youth work in the way that Davis uh, believes it is. 
So in terms of uh, possibilities, what, what can we do? Um, again, I think from both from my experience and you, you please draw on your experience as well to think about this, but I think there's something about if, we, if we're going to make youth work, uh, if we're going to enable youth work to happen in schools, we need to think about using the informal as well as the formal spaces. So the playground and the classroom ideas. So it isn't all about the formal settings. There's something about lunch times, break times, before school, after school, and in school. So it's, it's, it's used in all of those spaces and perhaps behaving slightly differently in each of those spaces is appropriate. And there's something there about understanding the rules um, of, and I put rules in quotes, of, of society or, or the cultural rules as well. There's something about activities for building rapport. So it isn't just about working with problem children, and that's, that's how schools would label these young people. It isn't just about working with them to get them to change their behaviour to fit into the school um, frame. It's also about doing things that are positive, that are, that are projected by young people, that actually are led by young people that support young people's voice within that school, that actually helps us develop meaningful relationships, not just with those that are referred to us, but actually all members of the school community. So that will include teachers, it will include parents, it will include young people. And actually there, is, there are great possibilities for creating a more cohesive school community. But to enable that to happen, we have to, persuade uh, school leaders that there's there's some value in the in the other things that we do not just the one-to-one -one with problem children so i put here it can youth work happen in schools it depends it depends on whether there's a shared understanding about the purpose and principles of youth work and i think that's something that as a profession we have struggled with for years and years and years and we have to stop struggling with that we have to come to terms with that we have to find ways of enabling those outside of the profession to understand what we do and why we do it and what underpins it so we have to be confident as youth workers to express that um, there needs to be a mutual trust and respect for the associated methodologies so youth workers have to develop a trust and respect for, for teachers and how they are doing their work and what their pressures and challenges are and uh, their, 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 their means, of, uh, means of working with. And we have to have a respect for that in the same way that teachers need to have a respect and a trust for, for, for what we are doing and, and, and our methodology. And again, just going back to Coburn and Gormley, they talk about educational methodology, which is really helpful for this particular setting. And the, the last point there is about this confidence in self, this professional identity, a sense of agency, but also an ability to facilitate collaboration. I think youth and community workers are ideally placed to support um, uh, collaboration between professionals. Uh, whether that's about youth work in schools or whether it's about working with social workers or police officers or health professionals i think it's the same this notion that we have to want to collaborate with others we have to want to work with others um, and to use our skills our interpersonal skills to enable that to happen um, this is my last slide so going back to this is the slide i started with there are all these uh, people around young people one thing I have found in my years of teaching is that I've come across youth workers that um, will talk very negatively about the relationships young people have with teachers and police officers and social workers and have a sense of belief that they are the only ones that understand young people, the only ones that can have good um, uh, positive relationships with, with young people. And I urge them to actually have some humility there as well 
because that kind of sense that we're the only ones that can work with young people is problematic and prevents that notion that actually working with others uh, at the edges of our practice um, is perhaps um, the way forward in terms of providing the best support for young people that we can. So I think that's uh, where I finish. So um, I'll hand you back now and stop sharing my screen. I hope that was mm -hmm. helpful and look forward to your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, just to remind if you just join us uh, that if you have questions to our guest speakers, you can post them in the questions and answers if you are in Zoom. And if you are following us on Facebook, then you can also share your questions uh, there. And Marietta is uh, gathering these questions, so we're attentive to them. And uh, various people ask about the recording. Yes, it will be available after on the social media of the Youth Partnership. And if you are part of the MOOC uh, as well on the uh, MOOC platform. Yes, uh, so. Yeah, that was about the questions and uh, now Maria, welcome. Uh, Maria Pisani, Maltese academic, youth worker and activist. And uh, Maria, your research interest is about forced migration, refugees and youth work in these conditions. Yes, so I think you can tell more us about this. Yeah, and thanks Susan. And also so for, sort of for preparing um, my own presentation. It's great to be here. I'm going to start by questioning the title of the, of, of the seminar, um, Boundaries and Youth Work. And I think it's amazing just to think of how we're transcending boundaries today. I was getting so excited seeing all the different countries coming up and, and how we are able to, to join together in this virtual space. So I'm looking at youth work in the borderlands, um, drawing on the work of Gloria Ann Zaldua, working with young refugees in Malta. And let me see if this is going, there it is. Um, I'm also drawing on um, a recent publication between Insecurity and Hope that draws together a number of different, I've forgotten the number, but considerable number of um, chapters on youth work in different contexts around Europe, not just the European Union, but around Europe from Turkey to Malta to to the UK and beyond. And for those of you that are interested in this topic, I think this could be an interesting source for you. Well, I'm speaking from Malta, um, which I've prepared a map here because I suspect that many of you have never even heard of the country before. We are the smallest and southernmost European member state um, with a population of around 450,000. I don't know if I've got my, yep, there you go. So if you see my cursor here, it's this little pink X. The X is bigger than the country itself. Pretty much in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And um, when we're talking about asylum seekers and refugees within the European context, we are specifically looking at the Mediterranean region. And today I'm going to be looking at the central Mediterranean route. So from Libya to Malta. But as many of you will be aware, there are many different routes. And um, as I'll show you a little bit later on, um, one of our key points of concern at the moment is particularly the, the island of Lesbos. Um, when I'm talking about refugees, we also need to be um, very aware that often in Europe, particularly in the EU, we can take a very, very EU-centric approach. Despite um, dominant rhetoric, in the European Union, the vast majority of refugees and displaced people live in the poorest countries of the world. And it is a trickle, to use aquatic, an aquatic metaphor, that are actually making their way to Europe. I want to draw attention to Lesbos. Um, the, the, the external borders of the European member states um, without argument, they face disproportionate responsibilities in housing and hosting refugees. And this is a problem. It's a challenge. Um, unfortunately, this, 
reality and also a global pandemic has also been used as a justification and an excuse to violate human rights. Um, a couple of days ago, there was a, a horrible fire in Lesbos and 13,000 people who were living in squalid conditions, refugees who were forced to flee their home are now homeless again. And this in the midst of a global pandemic. I'm going to refer just to one um, document for the simple reason that it goes into the importance of youth work and cross-sectoral cooperation in six key areas. And for those of you that know me, I will always take a critical approach. So the focus is on increased social exclusion. Let me start by saying, obviously, cross-sectoral cooperation is necessary and I think welcomed. But if we're working towards social inclusion, um, we're asked to take into account European values and I would raise questions as to what these European values represent given the way the European Union has approached um, the phenomena of asylum seekers crossing the Mediterranean. We're called for stronger participation of all young people in democratic and civil life in Europe. This raises questions about democracy. There are many different ways of practicing democracy and one of them is through elections and in order to be um, completely inclusive, it means that everyone needs to be a citizen. So we rather than celebrate democracy without thinking about it, we also need to look at how democracy can also be exclusionary and often used as, a, an, as an opportunity to um, violate human rights or the rights of the non citizen. We can look at the easier transit, uh, transition of young people from youth to adulthood, in particular in relation to the labor market. Obviously, everybody needs um, employment in order to be able to survive. But often, in the case of asylum seekers and particularly undocumented migrants, the transition from childhood to adulthood results in a loss of rights. We're also asked to support young people's health and well-being, including mental health. And I, it's not rocket science to raise the issue of mental health in relation to forced migration, the very nature of forced migration, but also how young people may be illegalized and face um, extraordinary um, challenges that may result in mental health problems. We can look at contributing to addressing the challenges and opportunities um, in terms of uh, the digital realities that we face today. This has been very interesting for us um, in, in COVID times. I'll look at uh, a little bit later on in my presentation as to how um, access to the internet was able to support our work. But the global pandemic has also highlighted um, the fractures, if you like, in, in, in our societies. They were always there, but um, the the pandemic has highlighted them and, and this has had massive impacts on young people and children across the board, not just with asylum seekers and refugees. So we're able to access information and education, relationships and friends through the internet um, at these difficult times. So the digital divide is something that we need to look at and contribute to responding to the opportunities and challenges um, raised by the number of young migrants and refugees in the European Union. So specifically, we are asked to look at the needs of asylum seekers and refugees um, who are making their way here. But in order to be able to address um, their needs, we also need to be very aware of the challenges that they face. Okay. I want to contextualize a little bit more just to give you an idea of the situation that we're an idea i mean it's just a couple of pointers um on um i think it's 27 migrants for more than a month now so the 4th of august it's more than a month have been stranded on a vessel a danish vessel um the mv etienne and denied safe access to a port essentially denied asylum as the 27 member states argue over who is responsible for the welfare and protection and immediate shelter of these asylum seekers. Now, the vast majority of people crossing in the central Mediterranean route are young men, um, many of them unaccompanied minors. And I've been told that there are unaccompanied minors on this vessel. There are, the others tend to be their late teens and in their 20s up to their early 30s. So they're all within the this sort of 
working category, if you like, of young people. So they're stranded out at sea. Um, I can't actually see my notes here because I've got my face on the right hand side. I didn't think about this when I prepared the PowerPoint. These are images um, that were carried in one of our national newspapers over the weekend. One of the asylum seekers obviously has access to a phone. He's not allowed access to a phone, but was able to film the, um, the inside of um, one of our detention centers in Malta and get it out to leak it to the media. Now our detention centers in Malta, the policy at the moment is actually illegal, has been found to be illegal by our local courts and yet they remain. Um, they are detained for months on end. Now I remind you that um, Malta is a, a signatory of the 1951 Geneva Convention and every individual has the right to claim asylum, which means that no crime has been committed. So they are illegally detained for months on end and they do not know when they will be released. Um, we call this the Easter Sunday tragedy. It was just at the beginning of um, quasi lockdown in Malta and a vessel that left Libya um, and we are all familiar with the context, the Libyan context right now and, and the, 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 the war going on there, the ongoing civil war, and a, a vessel of asylum seekers was pushed back to the Libyan coast from multi search and rescue, um, from this multi search and rescue zone. And this resulted in 12 deaths, again, all young people, a very clear violation of international human right law. So this is the context that we're working in. And one of the sort of the, the points that I want to, to, to drive home is that youth work it very much depends on, on the given context. Um, it is situated and how we work with young people very much depends um, on time and space and, and how these two blend together. I like to, to, to position youth work in the borderlands. Between borders is a non-binary space, is associated with a messy, fluid and creative space, not necessarily, necessarily chaotic, but a place of, of, of massive potential. I've already pointed out how much context matters, that it is a situated practice, and we can look at many different contexts just with asylum seekers and refugees from the humanitarian context working towards those that have protection and, uh, and will be legally residing within a given host country, uh, host context. A, a year ago, I was working um, for a very brief amount of time um, in Kakuma camp in, in Kenya, working with young refugees in the camp there, many of them who have been there all their lives. Um, and obviously the youth work that one would do in a camp in Kenya with young people that have never had the opportunity to leave this space and those that um, are in Malta will be very, very different and they will be different in England and they will be different in Turkey and so on and so forth. But it also gives us a youth work in the borderlands also gives us the opportunity, I would argue, to be transgressive, to be imaginative. My work is always unapologetically political. We work towards social justice. Um, I'm building on Susan's point here in terms of values. I always ask my students and, 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 and my colleagues, what do we stand for? Um, and it's important that we continue to question ourselves on this very issue. If you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. So it's important that we articulate exactly what we stand for um, every moment of our practice. And this also brings dilemmas. For example, one of our dilemmas is do we, when we are allowed, and we have done in the past, but um, it's always a dilemma for me, do we provide youth work in the detention centers, knowing at the same time that these very detention, that the, the, the actual detention policy is illegal, that these young people are being detained illegally? Are you rubber stamping? this policy by going in. And the alternative, if we choose not to go in, is literally leaving these young people with nothing to do. You saw the image um, of the conditions that they are living in, with nothing to do for months on end. So there are always ethical dilemmas 
in terms of not just how we do our youth work, but where we do our youth work. We also, I would argue, have a, a role in reminding states of their legal and moral obligations and raising awareness. But this also brings um, challenges. There is voice, the importance of representation, but also we need to represent those young people that are denied a voice, those people that are detained, those people that are regularly residing. Um, and if we speak on their behalf, what is the risk of colonizing their, their very voices? Another part of our practice is very much related to just having fun. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on sports and particularly football, um, developing friendships and this focus on relational practice. This is an image of our uh, drop-in center in Valletta. Um, there's a library, we do CV writing um, to um, facilitate access to the labor market. We provide IELTS learning to facilitate access to further education. And we also do informal in English classes and informal Maltese classes as well. Um, the drop-in is closed at the moment because of COVID. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we migrated our services online. And so we've managed to maintain our service um, using Zoom um, and, and, and maintaining contact through um, everyone that uses our service, all the young people that use our services um, online now. Obviously, this means it's limited to those that have access um, to the internet. This was incredibly important because at one point, one of the open centers with more than a thousand young men were all collectively in quarantine and their only access to the outside world was through the internet as well. So what about our cross-sectoral youth work? Well, I can give some examples of um, youth work specifically with asylum seekers and refugees. And, um, and this is something that came out in the, the research and the, and the book publication that I, I highlighted earlier on in my presentation. So certainly we all need to work with lawyers and we all need to be familiar with the legal context and all the different statuses and how these feed into access to rights. It doesn't mean that we are lawyers. We certainly don't provide legal advice, but you need a familiarity and you need to be able to provide access to human rights lawyers and, and other legal services. Also, an important part of our work is providing human rights education, generally delivered in a very informal way. We work with social workers who work in many different types of organizations as well, particularly focusing on housing and welfare and understanding um, the different needs of young people in this regard. At the moment, the transition from centers to, to um, private accommodation in the community is incredibly problematic. Um, and we have a rising number of homeless people. Um, so I'd say this is where youth work really came into its own actually, as, as many of us went out and started conducting detached outreach um, youth work with those young people to see how we could facilitate their access to um, temporary shelters and ultimately um, to some kind of permanent residence. I already mentioned that we support um, on CV writing and how to apply for jobs and we do role playing in terms of interviews, but this also means um, liaising with different job agencies, employment agencies as well. So we have an ongoing relationship there and often um, employment agencies will reach out to us too if they know of, um, of an employer that is in particular need of a number of young people, um, then they will reach out to us and, and we can facilitate that contact. We liaise with formal education institutions um, in preparing young people for generally further education through a number of different institutions in Malta. This includes English language training, IELTS, um, but also, also helping them with their homework, um, working, liaising with the youth workers in the different institutions as well. So there's a lot of space to maneuver there. We also liaise and partner uh, a lot with creatives and artists. These have included um, theatrical productions, um, different artistic productions, um, and also different sports organizations as well, particularly, but not exclusively, football. 
We also liaise, which I didn't put here, is with um, other youth clubs in Malta and also with the National Youth Agency and try to facilitate contact there. Often that's done through sports um, as a way of reaching out to Maltese youth who may be attending other youth clubs, at least there to, to develop the relationships and, and, and friendships. And also in relation to representation, we work a lot with journalists who want, many of the, many of the journalists in Malta want the, um, the refugee voice, they don't want my voice, and, and rightly so, they want young refugees to be able to speak on their behalf. So we work with young refugees um, to prepare them to be able to get their message across and in, in, in a clear way as possible in order to be able to advocate um, for their own rights and to get their stories out there. So um, working across different sectors has become very much a part of what we do on a, on a day to day, an hour to hour basis. I still go back to Fusco. Um, the use of self is not equivalent to building relationships, rather relationships are essential to creating the social conditions for change. I see youth work very much as a, as a, as a relational practice. Fusco looks at the individual and the community level. I would argue that it, um, we can be extended to the national, to the regional, and also to the global. Um, if COVID has taught us anything, it's um, how our relationships are global and how in order to move forward, we absolutely have to work together and transgress those boundaries. I'm going to stop, I think, with this slide. It's just to give you an idea of where my theoretical thinking is going at the moment. I'm very much digging into the work of Deleuze and Guattari and thinking about rhizomatic approaches that focus on multiplicity and decentering and working away from those hierarchies and looking at connections with different realities, different ideas and different people, also moving beyond the human and looking at planetary needs as well in self-directed ways, multifaceted um, and exciting. I think, creative, creative possibilities of working together. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for your interesting presentation. And um, I have a lot of emotions myself now, but after both uh, presentations, because there was a lot of uh, questions and things mentioned that I think are close to many of us and reflections that we have uh, lately. And uh, thank you for all of you who was asking the question. So now maybe we can uh, uh, go and move to the questions that participants had during the presentation. Maria, Susan, Susan is here. Also our colleague Hilary joined us. Uh, also one of the, she's part of the team of our MOOC. So, uh, hi Hilary. Hi everyone, how are you? Sorry for being late, but it's fascinating and really enjoying it. <laughs> Good, <laughs> thank you. So uh, we have uh, for now 12 questions, but there are some questions uh, and I will mention them that we will explore further in the, during the MOOC <laughs> because uh, uh, it was some questions uh, about for, uh, future topics. Uh, so let's start from the questions that had the most uh, votes and uh, what it's uh, I don't know from whom is this question it's anonym uh, do you believe it's necessary to establish boundaries between youth work and formal education are there other fields overlapping with youth work I think partly uh, Susan partly Maria already answered this question but maybe you would like to okay yeah um... yeah Susan I think it was to you yeah <laughs> I'm happy to, to start and then obviously Maria can, uh, can uh, offer an opinion as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the way the, the question is phrased really, because in some ways, I think the boundaries exist. Um, so I don't think we establish those boundaries. I think they are in existence. Um, and they, and there's, a, there's another question later on, and I want to try and pull that to the, together with this one, because there's something about youth workers um, working, as uh, Maria said, in, the, in, that, in that space between. And it, it, I think that space between is where we want to explore 
So there, there, there are these sort of boundaries that are, uh, are kind of known by teachers, by young people, by youth workers. We kind of recognize the, 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 these invisible boundaries between the two forms of, of education or learning. Um, and and we, all, we all know they're there, but actually we don't perhaps fully explore them and we don't challenge them and we don't question them sufficiently in my view. And we need to do that if we're going to use that space. And I think something that Maria said as well about in those spaces, there is great potential and it's about getting into those spaces and it's an, it's messy and it's confusing and it's troublesome and it's challenging but actually the potential is so great because there's something that youth workers can bring to that space that that the formal educators can't and there's something that formal educators will bring to that space that youth because we're not trying to be teachers and teachers are not trying to be youth workers that's not what it means when we come together in those spaces we hold on to who we are but we work in those in those tricky spaces and the question i was referring to that that comes later in this list is what what about young people because actually can they negotiate though that messy space as well i mean it's hard for us as as uh, professional workers so what is it like for young people and actually i think there's a real learning opportunity here about enabling those young people to recognize difference and to be able to challenge in appropriate ways um and 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 live with that messiness feel comfortable with that messiness because so many things in formal schooling are sort of fixed and structured and it's like every tuesday this happens every wednesday that happens well life isn't like that actually if we're preparing young people for life we need to prepare for messiness and and confusion and difference so that's why i think those spaces are so valuable i hope that goes some way to answer the question <laughs> thank you very much susan <laughs> maria do you have uh, do you want to add something no, I think because I think Susan really um, covered it, and I, I, I mean, and I completely agreed with what she said. I would say, I would say, embrace the messiness because that is, a, you know, that's mm. a, that is where we can really make a difference because there is so much potential mm. and opportunity. Um, I never thought when I was doing my youth work degree many years ago that I would be spending most of my professional work liaising with lawyers. I mean, I really did not see, I thought social workers, I thought police, but I didn't think lawyers. And, and these on, on at face value look very, very different, but actually we have um, much in common and just, just different ways of working. I can't do my job without a lawyer you know what, they can't do their job nearly as well without us either. So what does that borderland create? And it, it creates magic in very ugly circumstances. Thank you very much. Yeah. We never know what uh, waiting us next day, even in our work. And this is the beauty of our work, I think. And the next, que next question is from Mark Taylor. Uh, respect and trust take a long time to build. What do you think are the main ways to really foster that building between young people, teachers and youth workers? Okay, uh, if, shall I start again um, on that? Uh, I absolutely agree that uh, it's that notion of time. Um, uh, and uh, it's about being around as well. And I think the, the Blackham paper that I've uh, uh, suggested that people read is a really useful uh, paper that answers this question because um, what they chose to do and, and indeed what I've done in my own practice in the past is is that focus on when you when you go when you enter a school uh, environment as a youth worker um, for the first time is about holding on to what you your practice would be if you were working in any other space uh, in terms of thinking about building those relationships so persuading often in England 
is about persuading school leaders to give you the space and the time to build those relationships and a trust that those relationships will bear fruit later in terms of achieving the sorts of outcomes that the school is looking for yeah and also um, provide providing the outcomes that perhaps they hadn't even considered were possible which is particularly around parent engagement I think um, depending on where the school is set and, uh, and the degree of disadvantage of the community that that school is set in that the, the challenges of getting parents involved in schools is often difficult and yet schools have to really try to do that as part of their their um, their business and and I think using community workers are, are perhaps more um, uh, are able to spend more time working on that aspect as well and because we have a sort of community um, development aspect of our role we can we can develop that so I think it is about it is about time it's about doing good things um, well it's about do, being open to everybody so it's not just about focusing on the naughty children and the troublesome families it's about an open access approach in a in a formal setting does that make sense yeah. Yes, makes a lot of sense. And uh, I would uh, ask the same question to Maria because you work in uh, different conditions. Yes, and young people you work with are coming from different backgrounds and different situations. I, I would say time is every. I mean, I in in my slide I I said I, mm -hmm. I youth work is is a relational practice and mm -hmm. and you. Um, so relationships I see is very much at the core and trust, um, trust takes time. Trust needs to be tested as well. Um, and it's very difficult. Why should any young person who has had his rights violated on a daily basis, first perhaps in his homeland and then in transit and then in this country that I call home and I'm a citizen here, why should this person trust me? Um, I wouldn't. So, so this is something that, that obviously takes time. Um, and when I'm speaking about tr uh, trust, I, I don't want it to sound so, like something that's all unicorny either. I mean, it, it, it doesn't mean that we can't disagree. It doesn't mean um, that, that we um, always agree um, or, the, or the, that we're always on the same page, far from it. But I think that's when the relationship is really, really trusted. I would also say that oh, it, it has become, to a certain degree, easier for us over time. Because if you, we were, as, I mean, uh, when I say we, I'm now representing an NGO, and we were established 16 years ago. So for the first asylum seekers that are arriving in Malta, we were just this new face, and we had to really work hard to develop that trust. We still do. But, um, but now we have a history as well. So that, that trust has, has also developed and there are um, now refugees in Malta who are able to refer to us and say, this is someone that we trust. Now that doesn't mean that you, uh, you take that trust for granted or, or that, uh, but it, obviously it's made it a little bit easier over time. I would say as well, it's not just trust um, with, the, with the young people that we work with, but also in terms of cross-sexual practice um, I mean, detention, police, politicians, um, they might not agree with us, but I think there also needs to be, and there often isn't, um, an, an element of trust. And, and, and that's one of our massive struggles as well. Um, so not just in relation to trust with young people, but also trust um, with with the people that you that the organizations and the different sectors that, that we need to work with um, so it's it's not easy it's um, it's a terrain that we need to navigate every time and 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 map that course every time um, not easy no not at all uh, thank you for answer and uh, so we have the same uh, the next question it's quite uh, connected to what you already started to talk about uh, maria it's about the um, 
even though we will have it in upcoming models, the topic of the professionalization and recognition of youth work, but here comes the question about how do we professionalize youth work so that government affair can recognize the sector in other country where it is not recognized. Okay, well, um, I started my first degree in youth work 25 years ago. I also have a master's and today uh, in youth and community studies as well. And um, today I lecture with, I'm an academic with the Department of Youth and Community Studies. In Malta, the profession is recognized. Um, it's established in Maltese law. And I'm actually also on the board, the warranting board um, with, uh, for youth workers um, in Malta. So I'm in a very particular um, situation. A lot of that hard work has been done. But just because something is established in law um, doesn't mean that it's established and respected in the cultural realm. So again, I would say this goes back to time um, and, and um, really asserting um, with pride, I, I think, um, who we are and what we do. And at the same time, the challenge is, and at the same time, embrace all the diversity within um this youth work profession if you like yeah. because um even if i was to look at my colleagues within um you know at the university of malta we sometimes disagree on on what it means to be a youth worker i funnily enough also not funnily enough um i i also refer to davies um in in looking at perhaps those core principles but those core principles also need to be challenged and questioned all the time because our context is constantly evolving. Um, so being recognized as a profession, the, the ability to say I am a youth worker and know that that is um, established in law is, is a privilege. Um, to be acknowledged and respected on a day to day basis, that's a task that we that we are still struggling with. Thank you, Maria. Susan? Um, yeah, I kind of recognise everything that Maria has just said there, really. And uh, in the UK, uh, England context, we're not established in law. We have no legal basis, although we have a great tradition of qualified uh, professional youth workers since, um, I don't know, the 1970s. And we have several universities that offer professional courses. Um, but I think it is, it is something about whilst we don't have a, a we don't have, we, we're, we are airbrushed out of many things in the policy context. I think in the practical context, in local, you know, in the localities, youth workers are recognised and, uh, and supported by other, other professionals. And, and, and that comes from building relationships bottom up from the ground from working with people and developing those relationships and slowly slowly it comes through but i i always try to ensure that my that the students when they graduate from our courses have have a strength about them where they can take the knocks of of not being understood and not being recognized and not being valued and can come back from that with a with an argument as to why their presence is important in those shared spaces, what it is they can offer, but also to be able to do that without a dilution of their understanding and their commitment to the values associated with youth work. And I, I don't believe that there is a set of values that you have to have. I think there's a commitment that you need to have towards um, certain aspects and we'll all we'll all absorb and assimilate those values differently and that's okay because that leads to that diversity that Maria was talking about but there is something within that I think the professional education courses can support people in developing I think that's that's the that's the one thing I want them all to to graduate with is that strength of of professional identity that enables them to 
continue to forge new spaces for, for youth work. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm reading out the questions and some are a bit repeating, uh, but there is um, a question about uh, if there are any issues for the young people uh, themselves and, and differences, boundaries between non-formal and formal education when it occurs in the same physical setting. I'm also interested if you view after school clubs or things like student government as youth work or non-formal education. So I think this last part of the, do you see this, uh, yeah. yeah, after yeah. school clubs and school governments? Uh. Yeah, yeah, because I think we, we've kind of addressed the first part, but the second part mm -hmm. is a really interesting yeah. uh, question again, because I think it, it, we get back to messiness, don't we? There's no yes or no answer to, to these things. Um, it depends. It always depends. It depends on how things are enacted. How, how, you know, what is the reality of that after school um, uh, club? Because I, I think there are some fantastic examples of youth work happening in after school projects in, in, uh, in my context. Um, and there's probably some that are more aligned to perhaps non-formal um, learning spaces rather than informal learning spaces. So it depends on, on what the purpose is um, and who's, who's involved in running it and, 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 and how it's kind of set up really. Um, I've, I've, I have been quite critical of um, projects that suggest that they are in some ways um, uh, representing young people's views uh, so we have like uh, youth parliament, for example, in, in England, uh, which is a wonderful uh, idea. Uh, in practice, I'm quite concerned about the fact that that does probably uh, mirror our actual parliament, which is voted by a minority of people and is all about individuals' own interests. So, you know, I don't think it's a great uh, piece of youth work in some cases. Um, but it might be really good for some young people. So I'm not knocking it for, for that, but I think it just always depends on whether it's tokenistic um, or whether it's really uh, seeking to empower young people to, to bring about change. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the fence, it, it depends. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. So it depends really how much power do we give to young people in this yeah. uh, after school activities. Uh, Maria, do you want to add? Again, I, I, I agree with Susan. That's why I wasn't, do I speak or do I not speak? Um, because I, 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 I agree with Susan. I mean, I think we use the term informal education, non-formal education or formal education um, to describe context and methodologies. And I think these are important terms, but they're not youth work. They, they, uh, youth work is something different um, where we might use informal um, tools and non-formal tools and be within a formal and a non-formal and, and so on. Um, so, so I would question um, what's the point? What's, what's the point of what's going on and, and, and Again, this very much depends on, on time and space um, and what, what's the agenda. And, and then perhaps um, we can look at whether or not this is youth work or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for answers. Hilary had a comment. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you want to pronounce it or I just read it? <laughs> I, I'm to unmute, unmute. Sorry, I was, I'm trying to be careful with my microphone. I know I'm just really interested to hear what both Sue and, and Maria are saying and then the questions. And I think there's two things that strike me. So my comment is that I think as youth workers, are, we need to learn how to be, un, to be comfortable in uncomfortable spaces and potentially to be willing to be the source of discomfort in environments that are oppressive or that are silencing or marginalizing of young people and their experiences. And then the other thing that strikes me is, as Sue just said it there, I, I am absolutely convinced the longer that I'm in this area of work, 
is that the answer to most things, to most questions worthwhile asking in youth work are, it depends. You know, and I think that's where the professional space is really important, is to get comfortable with taking your time and figuring out what are the parameters of it depends. Mm -hmm. And then okay. acting in that, in that sort of space, mm -hmm. on, that, on that insight and that collaboration and those conversations and those values. And that's where and how you act. That's, yeah, so I'm just, yeah. I love this. This is great conversation. Thank you. Can I, can I say, Hilary, I mean, I, I knew what you were going to say because I, it was like, it depends. It was just kind of, um, and I think it's, it's about feeling confident with that as well, because you can easily be attacked for, yeah. for, for not, you know, for, for not keeping that boundary. And, and that's the point, you know, um, the, let's talk about the messiness. It depends. It's so situated and it's fine to embrace that messiness. So I, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> nice vibes we have here. <laughs> okay, and Maria, there is a question to you. The next question. Um, uh, it was, oh, I lost it. Uh, actually, it was, uh, ah, the Maria, your work seems quite challenging and hazard. How do you handle local political stress while you are accessing the information of refugees and vulnerable people in Malta? Um, well, it, um, I certainly don't carry this on my shoulders alone, that's for sure. Um, there are um, lots of amazing people that I work with and have been working with for, for many, many years. Um, and today it's also great to see young refugees and persons of color, Black Lives Matters movement made a difference in Malta as well. And, and, and so even Maltese persons of color on issues of racism stepping up um and and um addressing the, the the political challenges and the political challenges are huge not just locally not nationally but also in terms of the eu and and globally um when i look back um over i mean before i worked with young refugees i i worked with um substance abuse i worked with teenage mums so i've always worked sort of in the margins if you like um, but this one, this, this one is particularly difficult. And I would say over the last year, um, I don't want to, I, I don't want to paint a picture of everything that we do is, 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 is working. Cause it's not, I would say in, in terms of the political issues, our work is largely ineffective. Um, and at the most, what we provide is, is a, is a sticky tape, a cluster, um, it's 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 very difficult. I actually I, I can I can say that um, I've taken a decision over the summer um, to withdraw from from working as a, as a practitioner for a while and and not not to withdraw from the scene but to to take a step back to think uh, to think um, to re and I think this is important too um, when we speak about praxis. Um, I have a lot of um, grounded knowledge now, but I, I need to, to rethink um, uh, um, the ideas, certain ideas that I had in the past that I don't think work anymore, um, including whether or not youth work and my ideas of youth work belong in the 20, in the 19th century. Um, uh, so, so there's a lot of thinking that, that needs to be done. Um, and I'm sort of embracing that space also because I'm exhausted. Um, and maybe that's something that we didn't. So when I speak about, I said, uh, it's not a unicorn space. It's not a unicorn space. There is great potential, but it's also very, very difficult. And, uh, and maybe this is something um, that we don't speak about in, in terms of youth work and burnout. Um, often we are working in incredibly challenging conditions, not on our own. Um, and I would never compare my situation. Here I am in my home, for goodness sake, very comfortable. I have my water, I have my coffee. Um, I'm not in detention, so I don't want to even draw parallels, but, um, but that doesn't mean that um, it doesn't take its toll. It does, and this is something that we um, need to, to think about in, in, in our practice in order to remain or even pretend to be or attempt to be effective. Um, so practice is important, but God, thinking is really important too. And that sometimes means taking a step away um, 
to be able to, to see perhaps from a, uh, from a different perspective, because there are many, many different perspectives. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, yeah, so the deep reflection and uh, we tackled a lot of different questions. Still, we have some questions reminded in the questions and answers. Unfortunately, we don't have so much time, but uh, for example, there was questions about the career of youth worker and pathway for career, non-formal education, informal support for the projects all these topics we will uh, discover further in the next models of our MOOC. <laughs> so please keep in mind these questions and when it will be the moment, uh, we will have discussions about it so you can get answers. Also many people uh, become motivated and inspired to start cooperation between <laughs> different countries that are presented here. You are more than welcome. And I think that we will open this space on the MOOC as well for the next model so people you can share ideas and you can keep in touch as we have such a potential. Thank you very much Susan and Maria for your very interesting presentation and a lot of reflection now in my mind, <laughs> a lot of emotions and I think I will pass floor to Tanya. Thanks to all participants. Thank you very much for your participations and questions and sorry if we couldn't tackle all of them but still we're at the beginning of the process. So I, I believe we will have time to talk about them. So Tanya, floor is yours. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Hilary, and uh, welcome. I'm happy that the participants also could see uh, one of the, our, let's say our resident academic for the MOOC. Uh, Hilary has been advising on the learning flow and all the wonderful resources that are available there. And um, thank you, Susan and Maria for contributing from these two, uh, the, let's say exploring the boundaries and borderlands of youth work uh, with uh, education, pedagogy, formal education sector, and with um, the, the social inclusion aspect and in a very particular context of working with young refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented migrants. Um, actually, we have also done this. This is not a first reflection on this topic. The Youth Partnership has led uh, over 10 years a project on documenting history of youth work in Europe. And in module two, we tackled a little bit, we touched a bit on that uh, topic, but actually a few of those uh, sessions focused exactly on that as well, on understanding what what is youth work? Where does it, how does it position itself and where does it position itself in relation to social work, to social pedagogy, to education, to formal education, and even is it formal, informal uh, or non-formal education? So we will continue to explore those. You are welcome to go through the history, uh, the knowledge books and some of the summaries we have shared in the MOOC. And we look forward to uh, continuing to uh, your learning path and ours as well. Um, we will be opening up two new modules on Monday. And at the end, close to the end of those, on Tuesday, and close to the end of those uh, modules, we will have another uh, date uh, for another webinar. And there we will be having an exchange with uh, European representatives of European policy making structures to understand what, how do they see, how do they position youth work uh, in Europe. So once again, thank you. I have seen really it's been heartwarming to see people right where they are watching from, where they're connecting from. I hope um, this means that it's useful also for um, people from all over the world. Uh, perhaps uh, as a way out of this uh, webinar, you can write exactly the country and city you've been watching from, and uh, we will keep that uh, in our hearts. So um, thank you, Katya, for facilitating, and we meet again on the platform, uh, on the MOOC platform. Bye. We hope this video contributed to your learning about youth work.